I've done this lecture a couple times and I at different schools, so I, I started the lecture from when I finished graduate school in 2002 at the Art Institute of Chicago to the present. So you can kind of see um, a linear progression of my work since graduate school. Since you guys are students, I thought that might be a good place to start. Um, I have a lot of images. The, the lecture is a little heavy, heavy on materials and process. Um, I don't think of myself necessarily as I think of myself as a conceptual artist, but um, because of the way the work is made and that there's a bit of a mystery about what's happening, I am kind of explaining some things in the lecture. And because it's a small group, if there's this image that's up and you have a question, you can just yell it out um, while it's up. I'm just gonna show a lot of images, so it might, it might be easier than kind of trying to recall it at the end. Um, so this, can you all hear me okay? This, um, this image that I'll start with is from my graduate's um, studio at the Art Institute of Chicago in 2002. And these were white cube spaces. Um, so that, so in, in this particular space, I wanted to do a piece where it kind of did a reversal of, um, of modernism and take kind of this, this idea of modernism of clean, kind of cleaning out all the dark corners of history and, and having a blank slate and kind of reversing it and bringing in kind of these um, ruins of another space. So this was um, a piece called Renovation in 2002, and it's made of paper mache, um, cardboard, and foam core. And then these are some more details of that. And that, this, this slide was my graduate show at the Art Institute of Chicago. Again, it was a white cube space. Um, and what I was interested in doing was um, creating an empty room for my graduate school, graduate show, kind of, again, doing this, um, how, do you make, how do you make a room that's empty but still created, and also as my graduate show to kind of try not to, to, to create an empty space as the conclusion of what I was doing. And this, um, this piece was all created with layers of painted paper glued to the walls. And I, in my kitchen at the time, I drew, I took measurements of where everything touched the walls and kind of drew this map for myself. And after I glued these layers of painted paper to the walls, I let it dry and went back in and cut out these sections that corresponded to where maybe the sink hit the wall or the um, cabinets hit the wall. So it looked like a gutted space. And the floor was done the same way. So it's kind of this ghosting of a space. And with, with this piece, um, I, was, I was using as a reference <coughs> a space from my personal life that existed in its current condition. I didn't live in a gutted apartment. I lived in a, you know, a nice, a, a modest apartment. And, but it was sort of projecting this idea of what the space might look like in the future or what it looked like in the past before it had been renovated. This again is a shot from my graduate studio, um, and this was kind of created in the same way, and it's based on a bricked up window that you would see around Chicago. And I like this piece, it, you know, it's a temper, all this work was temporary. When it was done, I would scrape it off the walls. You can kind of see on the floor and either recycle the paper or throw it out. And I like this piece. Um, someone once had said to me they thought my work kind of reminded me of if you were rubbing your hand on a foggy window and you started to see an image appear. And I like the feeling of that in this piece, um, that it's sort of almost like a, mir a mirage, of, that it's sort of appearing, but it's not a full, um, it's, not a, it's not a full wall, it's just the window. And this is another piece along the same lines called Threshold. This is still from 2002. Um, and this is based on thresholds you'd see around Chicago a lot. And it's, it's cut paper that, it, that again <coughs> is sort of cut to size of tiles, <coughs> glued in layers on the floor, and I'd let it dry and then I would scrape it up. And I would kind of <coughs> peel this paper off the floor until it looked like the, the piece kind of existed in this condition of sort of there, it's sort of not there. You get the idea it may not be there very long, that it's, it's in transition somehow. And it's, 
it's different to see the images than to see the actual work because the images are very convincing. But when you see the actual, when you see this act, this actual work in person, <coughs> everything's flat, so it's almost more like a collage. But when you first approach it, you think you know what it is. But as you got, as you get closer, you sort of realize it's not quite what you thought it was. It's not actual. It's not an actual architectural um, detail. And so after that, I did a larger piece after I graduated at Gallery 400 in Chicago. And I included this slide because it's from a model. Um, with a lot of this larger installation work, I'd make a uh, to scale, like almost shoebox size model and take pictures with a camera so that um, the venue could sort of see what I wanted the final piece to look like. And, and they were very carefully planned out because the work was quite laborious and um, looked very chaotic. I had to be pretty clear about the steps I was going through. So this was for, this is a this is a drawing of the proposal. Gallery 400 was a really large space um, with these columns down the middle. And I wanted to make it look like it was a, there was a gutted, perhaps a gutted hotel lobby in the back of the space. And I, I based the actual, the piece that I was gonna do on the lobby of my apartment building at the time that was kind of I think the apartment building I lived in used to be a hotel, so it kind of had a grandish type lobby that was, you know, not really kept up. But I just used the measurements from the architectural detail. And this is an installation shot um, to show you. I would lay these, I'd make these sections of paper in my studio and then lay them on the ground in the gallery and kind of build up all these layers of painted paper. And this is what the final piece looked like. Um, the gallery was quite large, so this was sort of existing in maybe the back third of the gallery. I don't have a good shot of the whole thing. Um, so you sort of walked in, kind of walked in, and you could walk into the piece and try to sort of figure out what had been going on. And I, this is a reminder, the gallery <coughs> was white when I started. Um, and when I was installing this piece, someone had come up to me and they were like, you know, try, a lot of times when I'm installing, people think I'm um, somebody who works with the space who's trying to help clean it up after the last <laughs> show or renovate it. So somebody came up to me and they're like, you know, are you, you know, are you putting this up or are you taking it down? Like, Perfect. Like that's just the state I want it to be in. Is when you're, you're just not almost like it's hovering between, you know, being done or being taken down. And this was, this was probably the largest piece I've ever done of this type of work. These, the windows were created with card, strips of cardboard that were cut to the size of the different um, window panes and stapled to the wall, and then paper mache over. And then the edges of the piece would kind of slowly fade to white, um, so they sort of disappeared back into the white wall. In this piece, I left the debris from where I had been scraping off the wall. I mean, this this piece probably took 10 days to install, um, and <clears throat> me being there quite a bit of the time. So it's sort of these um, indications of where things were missing. And I, was, I, mean, I was interested in things that revolved around memory and absence and kind of these dislocated spaces. And the next um, piece I had done after that was in 2003 at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Um, they have a program called the 12 by 12 Room where they show a new um, emerging artist every month. So I was asked to do a piece. And this image, again, is from a model, a miniature model I showed them. And I was really excited to be able um, to be invited to do something in a modern art museum because I think the context of this work is much better if it's in the more modern the building the better and I thought you know what what kind of space can I create in a modern art museum that would be just completely appalling for them to have the public see something that some sort of space they'd rather be hidden from the public and I thought you know a dirty public bathroom would be would probably be a good a good um, a good idea of a space to bring into a modern art museum and have people kind of do that double take, like 
you know, how is it possible to see something like that in this building? And this was based on the public bathroom that um, I used at my art studio building at the time. So I just took all the measurements from that. And this, uh, these again are installation shots just showing you the layers of the paper going up on the wall. And I would glue all these hand cut layers of, um, I was using craft paper, these hand cut layers of craft paper. Um, so it would take certain steps while it was, it would have to dry before I did the next step. This was a guy changing light bulbs. And it, I thought it was great because he kind of looked like the artist in the shop. <laughs> you know, the public could see me doing this, so they were all very curious about what was going on and if something was being renovated. And it's kind of an interesting way to get the public involved. Um, they, if the public sees me um, doing this type of work, it's, I think it's, it, they can enter it on a very um, basic level, which are really nice. And this is me um, going in and, sc and scraping the tiles off the wall. Kind of <coughs> feel like, you know, there's like this aspect of being Cinderella or something. Being like the last person at the gallery finishing up the project. Um, this is the finished piece. And the, um, the toilets and the sinks and the pipes and everything were also cast. Well, they weren't really cast. They were handmade from paper mache. So when you, they had form, but you, when you went up to them, you, you saw that they were just these, like a simple layer of painted paper. And I was kind of, when I was, when I think of this work, you know, I consider myself more a painter than anything because, you know, I was interested in creating all this work from paper because I could paint it in three dimensions. And when I was doing this work and making these objects, I, I had taken this Chinese archaeology class at the Art Institute. And there was a story that I was interested in where when they first started excavating China, they started finding these um, vessels and pots and pans in the ground that um, were incredibly thin. So they looked like functional objects, but actually if you use them, they would just shatter. And they took an incredibly long time to make. And the archaeologists were trying to figure out you know, what, what they were for and why they were made that way. And um, what they realized is they were being put in the tombs to show the gods what they needed to make for the person to use in their afterlife. And so they were essentially these maps of what the gods were supposed to build. And I thought that was a really beautiful example of representation versus, you know, a functional object. And that image kind of stuck with me of these everyday um, items or vessels or pots that sort of would break like eggshells. And I had that in my head when I was kind of trying to make these very simple objects um, that looked realistic, but once you walked up on them, the illusion would kind of fall apart and they would sort of look like they were being torn or, or broken like each other. These are just more sh shots. And then the rest of the room was kind of left white. It was just happening in one room. How close can you get to the, the, your work? Um, this piece, you could walk right up to it. I mean, it wasn't roped off or anything. And the, the larger piece um, that looked like the hotel lobby, you could actually walk on the floor of that piece. This one was sort of problematic because this room had a rug. Um, so I couldn't glue things to the floor like I would have liked to. So I, I made it on a thin board. Did you make it convincing? Did you work with photographs or did you spend a lot of time in spaces like that? Um, no, it's just... <laughs> hey, the, the public bathroom, this is the public bathroom at the Art Institute that really didn't look this bad, but um, they were kind of horrified when they found out that that was what it was based on. Um, it's, it was just through the process it starts to look like this, but I'm not actually looking at photographs of ruins. I'm actually looking at, um, I would go in the actual space and actually write down how large the tile was, how many there were, and just to get it to scale reference of the space. And just through my breaking it down, it became a ruin that was familiar, but I wasn't actually looking at images of ruins. And you know, a lot of times when I was asked to do particular 
installations, the curator would be so excited because you know the museum had a really crappy, leaky basement, and they're like, "Perfect! If, you know, we thought of you, and we're gonna let you do a show there." And I was sort of like, you know, that's my work. I don't want that space. <laughs> you know, I don't have a fetish for ruins. It's, I really want to be in like the nice room. So it's kind of a funny. That's why the mocking in the Museum of Contemporary Art was so great. It was like a perfect context. Um, this was a piece, again, all made out of paper mache um, called Slop Sink. I think it was in 2004 at the Bronx Museum. So at this point, I had moved to New York from Chicago. And this was based <coughs> on um, the Slop Sink from my art studio at the time. And I kind of rebuilt the corner that I was always washing with brushes in. So this, up to this point, the work was really based on kind of spaces I was engaged in. And, um, you know, they, they sort of had this memorial aspect or this diorama aspect to them. And they're not really site specific, like this piece can go up anywhere, so it's more site adaptive than anything. Um, this piece was called Childhood Bedroom. Again, I think it's 2004 at the Drawing Center in New York. And they had a show, um, a group show of artists that somehow had a process they considered interesting. So um, this this space was based on the the architectural detail from my childhood bedroom. My parents still live in the same house I grew up in, um, so I had my mother give me the measurements over the phone of everything. And then when I was a child, my bedroom was pink. And then at some point. When I was a teenager, it was painted blue, and now the room exists as yellow. So I kind of wanted this um, almost like archaeology of me going back in and trying to reveal this pink bedroom that I knew as a child. So there's this aspect of, um, it, I mean, there's almost a performative aspect to the work, except I'm not really doing it in public. But, you know, I'm pretty highly engaged in the process. Um, and I, and in this piece, and in some of the and in the other work too, I felt I was calling it reverse archaeology, that I was the one who was kind of embedding this information, and then I was covering it up, and then I was going back and revealing it. So there's this aspect of kind of a play between concealing and revealing, and almost re-revealing something, so you thought about it in a different way. So during the course of the show. And I don't normally do this, but it was for this particular show where I went in maybe once a week and scraped away at the walls so the piece kind of changed. And another aspect of the work I find interesting, was interesting to me is that, you know, it looks subtractive that I'm actually digging into the wall, but I'm not actually touching the wall per se, I'm adding to it. I mean, it's subtractive a little bit as I kind of work on it, but essentially there's all these layers built up on top of the wall. But the illusion is I'm going into the wall. So the drawing center curator was telling me, she was telling people that, you know, they had discovered this Dutch interior under the surface of the drawing room and people thought that would, you know, people were just really confused about what was going on. And <coughs> at the opening, my favorite moment was this view, this guy who was a viewer came up to me and he looked incredibly confused and he said, you know, I, I can't believe you found your childhood bedroom under the walls of the drawing center. It was just like, that's so weird. And, like, and I thought that was really great, like he actually believed it, even though it was totally absurd. And like, he actually lived there. So he was my favorite viewer. He was so, he was so just amazed by it. And this piece was a smaller piece, but it was also kind of one that people responded to in a way that was made it one of my favorites. Um, and it was based on subway tile in the, in the Brooklyn subway. It kind of says 7th Avenue. It's a particular subway if you live in Brooklyn. And it was at my actual subway stop um, in Brooklyn when I go home. So I was basing it just on this you know, moment from my life where I see this subway tile and sign in the subway. And it, this was at Rotunda Gallery, maybe in 2005. Um, and it was installed, Rotunda Gallery has two floors. So this is actually the top floor, and you walk down another level to the gallery. So 
the, it was a group show and all the artwork so it was hung quite low, much lower than my piece. So you almost didn't see my piece immediately. And I kind of nestled it up by some actual pipes and I made a paper mache pipe that looked like it was broken and that maybe there was a leak and then um, something was being revealed in the watermark. And then, so the night of the opening, so many people came up to me, even though they knew me, they knew my work, and um, they knew it was a group show, but you know, they came in, they saw the leak, they ran and got the curator because they thought their work was going to get damaged underneath it, and then they were like, oh, it's, um, that's kind of interesting, it's subway tile, you know, I wonder what subway went through here, and then they're like, oh, that's this, you know, the F line, that's, that's interesting, and then they're like, well, the F line, we're like three stories above the ground. The F-line doesn't go anywhere near here. <laughs> and then they were kind of like, oh, it's, you know, it's art. <laughs> but it, they were at an art show, and it took them that long to get to that point. But it was great, because they had to rethink what they were looking at, what they were expecting to see. And um, I liked that they were kind of led down this logical train of reasoning. But then when they got to the end, the, the conclusion was kind of impossible. So they had to go back and, and reassess what they saw. Um, this was another piece in Brooklyn at Smackmillan, which it, 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 the gallery isn't in the state of disarray that it kind of looks like it is, but I um, created that branch. It's installed pretty high up, probably, I don't know, 20 feet up. Um, and it's, it's made out of paper mache. And then I made it look like the bricks and the, ga the gallery wall was cracking and sort of in danger of kind of falling through and this branch coming through. So my work is actually just these pieces of cardboard cut the size of bricks that are paper mache grafted on the wall with paper mache and then I kind of rip a crack in it. And this is um, just one image from a, a group show in Tokyo where um, I was given a room kind of like at PS1 in New York, a school room to work with. And in this, this, this piece, I kind of wrapped the room in paper and painted the layers of paper the same color as what was underneath, and then tore away at the paper. So it was, it was almost like wrapping a gift, a, a gift wrapping something, and then kind of peeling away at it and revealing what's underneath. So it was almost representing this room. And when I was thinking about my work, I was thinking, you know, what, what I really like about my work is when is sort of these moments where there's just these these cracks or these fissures in the wall um, and sort of thinking about Gordon Matt Clark and his work that they're just these very simple um, <coughs> indications that the wall could be breaking but my work is essentially the crack so this is a crack I made in this wall in my studio that's sort of it extended and then a collector bought a crack, so I, I had to go to their um, their apartment and make this crack for them. So I kind of, you can see in this one too, it's, you can see where it's kind of, the, the part that's mine doesn't quite match the wall. So you, and, they, and I made a little branch too. So when you, people would walk into their place, they'd kind of think this wall was crumbling, but you know, as you walked up closer, you would start to see the illusion be revealed. And this is um, a piece at PS1 in the Greater New York Show in maybe 2006, um, <coughs> where I, I made this tree out of paper mache and kind of grafted it on the wall. And the, this was an interesting space to work in because it wasn't a white gallery space, so it, it was nice to sort of have different detail to work with. <coughs> and I, I basically just kind of paper mache it to the wall paint everything the same color as whatever it's sitting on, and then let it dry and then rip it away at it. Um, and I like this idea that, you know, in, in the location of the building, there was probably a tree before it was built, and then probably will be a tree in the future when the building falls down. So there's this um, moment where, you know, the future and the past are kind of fusing with this present hallway. And the cleaning paper people went crazy over this piece because it kind of appeared overnight and they had to come in at night and mop the floor and they thought it was like the funniest thing <laughs> that this tree had somehow just appeared overnight. 
the tiles on the floor was just sort of paper painted the same color and ripped. So the illusion is quite simple, but it's pretty convincing because you think, your eye kind of thinks it knows what it's looking at. This was a piece at White Columns um, in a group show that was kind of a revolved around Gordon Matta Clark's work. And this was called Rosebush for Gordon Matta Clark. And it was installed quite high up again by the pipes. So when you walked in the space, you just noticed this crack in the wall um, that was the root system. And the, the bush I, I fabricated out of water and paper and paint and then you know grafted it to the wall. And I like that it's kind of, you know, this Roman, almost this um, memorial to his work and also the rose bush being kind of this domestic plant that's being also functioning invasively and kind of fragmenting the thing. This was another version in my studio. Um, this is from my first solo show at uh, Gild and Gray School Gallery in New York. And I was thinking a lot about landscape and wanting to do a show about landscape painting but didn't really want to hang anything nicely on the wall and I, I and I, so I wanted to have I mean been doing this other work with nature and kind of wanted this moment from nature the landscape to be re-entering look like it's pushing its way back in the gallery this is kind of a confusing show to photograph but it looked sort of like this log cabin that was pushing back into the wall and breaking the wall and there were these fragments of the wall that were falling down. And I kind of made the floor look like it was cracking in the corner. And then there was a, a moment where there was this ladder and kind of painting supplies, like someone was trying to repair things, and that was all fabricated too. I think. the way the white functioned too. This was supposed to look like the area where the cabin was pushing through and this area of white from the gallery wall fell on the floor, but it also kind of read as snow, as snow too. These were the painting object, painting supplies that were fabricated too by the paper and There was one pane of the window that was broken and if you looked inside there was like this loosely made diorama of a stream going through the woods. So the more interior you got in the piece, you sort of had this exterior view. What material is that on the window? That was plexiglass. <clears throat> yeah. um, and then on the other side, there was this tree that looked like it was growing up through the wall. So I went from that piece to um, the next piece, which was almost based on the same landscape painting I was using as a color key for the other piece. This is a beer stat um, called, the, beer, the actual beer stat painting is called Among the Sierras, and my version is called Among the Sierras with Woodpecker. And I, um, I wanted to make this, I was, in, I was going um, to show a piece at <coughs> an art fair, and, and, the, and the context, so the context was an art fair, and I wasn't allowed to glue anything on the walls for an art fair, and I thought, you know, I want to kind of make this painting like this grand, you know, huge painting that's almost too big for the booth, and then have it look like it had been blasted by machine gun fire. But only after you have that initial response to it would you maybe realize the real culprit's a woodpecker that's kind of in the upper right. So I, I spent a lot of time recreating this painting myself to scale, and it's made on, um, a bunch of foam core tacked together. So it, it had a real um, thickness to it. So when you when you saw it in person, you know, I wanted it to look like the actual painting, but I also wanted it to look like when you went up to it, that it was a sculpture of a painting. Um, so I kind of painstakingly painted this huge bear stat and then went back and carved all these holes in it where I wanted it to look like the gunfire. And that's the woodpecker. And then, yeah, you know, I wanted it to be this um, American, this landscape from American art history um, that was having kind of this war damage, what looked like war damage done to it, um, 
and, but actually the woodpecker is an animal that looks for insects and infestations. So this idea that this um, this bird that could have escaped from the painting almost had turned on itself. So this this um, this idea of the American landscape sort of destroying itself somehow. And this is its final resting place at a collector's in Florida. And there was great think of this really glamorous dining room. It was sort of a perfect <coughs> place for the piece to exist among all this other stuff. And those aren't actual holes in the wall. Again, it's all in, it's an <coughs> illusion with paper and paint. Nothing. I didn't act. I wasn't. I mean, they would have killed me if I made holes in the wall. <laughs> they. But it's. It's paper glued to the wall and then kind of ripped and painted dark in the middle, so it looked like. It. And the ne the next piece I did was sort of playing off that piece, and it was for another art fair, the Armory, again I think in 2006. Um, and I I was doing this work in you know in the context of art fairs, and I kind of wanted to do something that was again sort of these paintings that are being destroyed by the outside world, but also this idea of a feeding frenzy in the art world and sort of this flock kind of rushing into the space and tearing apart these paintings. And there, there are copies of Raphael Peel's paintings, these two still lifes. This is a shot from his studio. Um, so I, co I copied the paintings again on foam core and then um, carved these holes in it and fabricated the birds and the frames also. And also thinking about representational painting, there's a you know, great a Greek story about who's the best, um, who's the best painter, and it's the person who can trick. It's the person who can trick nature. The, the birds think his fruit is real, so he's the best painter. So also this idea in an art fair that you're going out to find the best artist, like these birds. Find, you know, I'm the best artist because look, I tricked this whole flock of crows at the art fair. And I, I picked these still lifes that were particularly morbid and, and wanted it to be kind of this uber still life. Um, kind of nature more painting. Um, yeah, the still life's about life and death, but I'm going to like kind of hand it over the head. So it looked like when they were tearing apart the paintings, it was a little kind of painted a little visceral, viscerally inside. And after that, I did my second solo show at Gilman Grace Hall. Um, I forget what year this is, probably 2007, and it's called Seascape, and it was sort of the idea, what if um, a flood rushed through an American history um, show about the sea? So I, I chose objects from American history and seascapes to play with. And the piece in the back is called Overseas, and it's based on a fireplace from the Met, and then that's a Frederick Church iceberg painting that I remade myself hanging on for the mantle. And um, the, the harpoons kind of stabbing into the fireplace, sort of talking about this aggressive way of looking at other places. And when you, I don't know if I have a detail, but when you look up close, the, when the harpoon kind of hits the bullseye of the iceberg, like this stuff is kind of ice and sand, and stuff is flowing out of the painting, so it's sort of what's unleashing this force in the gallery. You can kind of see it there. And also thinking of the harpoon almost like a, a paintbrush on a painting. This is called Fish Frame. This is a George Washington, <coughs> George Washington on a stick. Um, this was a bust of Andrew Jackson, and that's a Homer watercolor on the right. This was a early American chair. And then this large piece was the top three <coughs> feet. No. Yeah. I forget how many feet. Maybe the top three feet of Washington crosses the Delaware. And I wanted it to kind of look like the, wreck, the wreckage of a ship or a dock or something. It was just a stretch of ours showing. And then the only thing you see with the first three feet of the painting is kind of this tip of the American flag that looks similar to the harpoon. Well, this is that paper as well? Um, yeah, this is foam core paper mache and paint. And that's real rope. 
that, uh, sometimes there's some real uh, real material mixed in. This is um, Paul Revere tea set. This is all um, foam coring paper mache. And this is called Driftwood Painting. So I wanted to make the make a seascape just from have the driftwood be making its own seascape. And then after that, um, I did a show in London at Museum 52. And this was an armoire based on an early American armoire on the Met. And it's, again, all fabricated from foam core and paper mache. And um, I had seen these images from a military graveyard of kind of jeeps and other vehicles that had been shot through and discarded. And they kind of look like straight out of a cartoon, like Swiss cheese. And I, that image really stuck in my head. And so this was another kind of woodpecker themed piece, um, but I wanted this this sort of large scale object to look like Swiss cheese almost. And there was a woodpecker in the gallery you kind of saw later. And some of these other pieces look, again, look like they had been shot through. Um, this was based on a Paul Revere tea set. It's created out of paper. And then the vitrines wood in uh, plexiglass. This is a beer stack poster. Um, George Washington as if gnawed by a beaver or something. <laughs> and then this was, um, a, uh, I think this was called Cracked Canyon. And this, I copied a Thomas Moran Grand Canyon painting and then I wanted to do this really subtle, like, crack through the wall with a, you know, all, all, all that happens with the pieces, it kind of shifts seismically on the wall. And then this was um, called Niagara Falls, and I copied a, I think it was a beer stat Niagara Falls, um, and wanted it to kind of look like the painting itself maybe had gone over the falls. And this was a group show at Demelio Terrace in New York, maybe two years ago. Um, and my piece is in the back left, and it's just a crack in the wall. And I, I really like it in the context of this other sculptural work that the you know this actual work gesture that I'm doing um, is sculptural in its own way. And this was another version of Cracked Canyon. I did an artist space just with a poster, so it was a very simple. You know, I made the crack out of paper mache and then just wrote the poster. It's kind of a very simple um, installation. This is the piece that's at the Brooklyn Museum right now called Fallen Bierstadt. Um, it's based on a Bierstadt painting and again made to look like it had sort of been maybe over the falls and rotting in the woods for a while. And then I did a show in Texas and I thought I'd play with some modernist. I mean there's this aspect of kind of picking this heroic American artwork in kind of um, bringing them to ruin. So um, this was called, I think, Rothko Reflection. And sort of made to look like it had been sunk in the sea. This was called Still Burning, based on a Clifford Still, as if it had gone up in flames. This was a Homer's Driftwood. This is, um, was a drawing of the idea that a Homer painting had gotten swept up in a Homer painting. So, and the idea of Homer was really sort of swept away by this imagery of the sea. And this was the piece kind of based on that drawing, the Homer painting of the wave. This was another George Washington. <coughs> this was a poster that I manipulated, like it had been eaten by termites. This is another called George Washington Shipwrecked. I mean, I was using all these, I was working with this early American imagery and was kind of using these George Washington images because there's so many portraits of him and they're quite recognizable. Um, and so I kind of was using it. And I was interested in how much of the image you could take away and still recognize what it was underneath. This was another smaller Rothko. And the, this was for an art fair. I was, think, I was thinking about trying to abstract the painting more. 
to sort of um, the colors of this painting are based on a fall leaf, and then the paint, the structures are kind of turning into this tree underneath. And this was one that was supposed to kind of look like a seashell. The painting had been twisted in the sea. And then this is, um, I think the last images are just more recently, probably this past year. They're sort of interested in, you know, there's this whole body of the work that's about kind of tearing down the piece and, um, and sort of what comes next, what does the piece transform into? And um, this was a piece I did thinking of that, that, yeah, there's sort of this breakdown in the idea that this um, piece that could have been a landscape is returning to the earth, but it's sort of growing into a new shape. This was another George Washington. <laughs> um, and this is a recent piece of sort of a landscape painting that's kind of turning into a tree. This one I used some, some real moss on, it's a new material. Um, and then these are a couple, or maybe one drawing of some work I did this summer where I was um, interested in this idea of kind of breaking down the form, but um, using pigeons on sculptures as a way to dissolve the form, but also have it be something that um, we think of with public sculptures that, you know, it's usually kind of covered in these birds. <coughs> And then these were, this is some work in my studio that was kind of the last stuff I've been working on. The, and I wanted the bus to kind of be a little mysterious underneath, like there were these flapping pigeons, but maybe they were kind of re-sculpting the piece in a way, or, you know, the piece is somehow in transition. And I'm also kind of looking at these, um, on the, on the very left is the, another Cracked Canyon piece, just the, post, the poster, um, the Thomas Moran poster of, the, of this kind of sublime landscape painting. And then I'm also looking, I was looking, starting to look at these images from space. There are also these sort of sublime landscapes and how the color schemes are similar, but these, you know, these shapes are really interesting on the right. They're more mis sort of mysterious. And I think this might be the last slide of my studio and just a few things I'm working on now. And I, so I'm, I'm starting to work for sh towards a show in February, which is kind of soon. <laughs> and I think, yeah, and that's a shot of my studio. That's the last slide. So um, that's all my work, but I can answer questions. didn't exist, I think 
I would probably have to get way slicker and have the work kind of be a totally other thing in a way. So it's, it is important to me. I think sometimes the work's much more interesting in a group show because you it's not in its own pocket of reality. It's kind of mixed in with other people's realities and the reality of the gallery. And that's what's interesting too. So, um, I mean, the work's changed too. I mean, it's evolved in different ways that it's not, when you see the newer work, like the painting turning into a tree, I don't know that you necessarily believe it the way you might believe the decaying space. It's not as, it's not as, it's not supposed to be, it's almost more surrealist or something, but um, there's still that aspect of like one thing changing into the other, which is interesting to me. So, I mean, people have asked me about stage set design before too, and I took a class at the Art Institute thinking that might be interesting, and then I kind of wanted to use it a little, I mean, like you could build up the gallery, have a certain perspective, and like all these different things, and I almost wanted it to stay true to the architecture underneath because that provided a layer of reality, like a physical reality. And the, the decaying spaces are just these veils of paper. I mean, it's a really thin, um, nothing's built out and that's what's kind of nice about it. Was kind of, it was almost like wallpaper or something. Um, that's how thin the illusion was and that was interesting to me. So, so then you're not actually building any walls no. or create any of the space. No, I would just use what was there. Mm -hmm. And kind of, I'd go look at it first and think like, what what could I put here that might look like it was possible? So it, it was kind of, in that way maybe it was site specific, but I was never looking into the history of the space or anything like that. It was more just looking architecturally like, you know, what would be the most appropriate thing to do here. So I was thinking, for instance, the bedroom. Piece. Yeah, that was the, the actual structure yeah, that was that there, was what was and there. it just happened to fit the dimensions that you were looking no, for. No, I mean the dimensions sort of like the dimensions of the window and the door are right in the height, but I just extended it I as see. far as they gave me the space, so it's not it's not true to the actual wall size. Okay. I was just I noticed that you started off with a sense of like empty space, and then. It seemed you moved more towards objects mm -hmm. that fill space, um, and I was wondering if that has something to do with a change in your life. Like originally having your, you know, your set place as a student, and then transitioning to the market and actually having mm -hmm. to sell pieces, or if there might be something else that you're playing with there, um, like something that you're achieving with that play of absence and presence, like what's there and what's not mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah, that's a good question that a lot of that people have asked because it, she was saying the work going from the, the the sense of absence to these sculptural objects and part of it was um, being in a more commercial, I mean this is part of being in a more commercial scene that the, the other work can be problematic but on the other hand people will buy anything so you don't have to be driven by that by any means. There, there is the physical component. It's, it's quite exhausting work. Um, the work I do now, of course, is just as exhausting. It's just different. But um, um, w one reason I moved to these objects is I just felt like when I hit a point with this wall work where I knew how to do it, people really liked it. Um, I could do it for years and years, but it was just starting not to get very interesting to me. And I thought, you know, I, I still like that hook in reality that you were talking about and I'm working within these gallery spaces. What else is in the gallery I can play with? Um, and I thought, well, there's artwork in the gallery. And I went to my gallery and I said, you know, you think some of the other artists would be cool with me like breaking their artwork or like I got <laughs> holes in it and they're like, you know, no way, like make your own artwork. <laughs> so, and then that kind of opened up this whole thing like I can make the artwork mine, I can do whatever I want, and you know, like when you see the Grand Canyon piece, like, you know, I spent a long time painting that painting, but what I really wanted to do was make Sorry. it go like this, like with a crack, <laughs> but, um, you know, so I had to create this <coughs> object to do that, too, so it's kind of an interesting problem, actually. Um, the show I'm working on now, I'm kind of interested in the possibility of bringing those two things together, like some somehow the wall and the piece and a little bit of the space 
I mean, I haven't achieved it yet, but it's sort of interested in how they could work together a little bit more. Um, so kind of, it's been evolving for different reasons. I mean, and there are, with art fairs, you can't alter the walls. Um, and so that kind of presented this problem for me, which, you know, I solved by creating the artwork. So that kind of started me in that direction. Actually, that kind of brings me to something else. Um, I noticed that you said you really want to destroy the work. Um, is that even because it's sort of a freedom? Because uh, it used to be like there was that cleanliness, everything had to be white and kept organized. And it's like you're really wanting to break that. Um, and like I noticed your work was more static at the beginning and then it became more about movement and like birds showing up and it's sort of alluding to action happening right. and all these rifts and like violent things that um, might happen. It's alluding to all this movement. Um, is that, I don't know, is there some kind of motivation there with uh, breaking that static stability that usually would be, used to be really enforced in the art world and now you get to play with that and actually really play with the whole space and like break those restrictions. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of different reasons I'm kind of drawn to doing that. And, you know, this um, this idea of sort of um, creating history, too, by making something look ruined is sort of interesting to me, and especially with American history. You know, what? that's why I kind of started with, like, early American history and what these, these paintings sort of talking about American identity. And I was sort of like, how can I kind of Manipulate them so that maybe they're a more accurate, re they're, they're a more accurate reflection of the world. But you know, there's always this aspect where I make it look like nature did it, like the nature's the artist, so <coughs> like the nature's kind of moving around, and these historic events are happening through nature. And does that somehow make the, the history painting that's gone through this history more historic? Like sort of playing with that too. Um, and the fact that we're such a new country that we don't, you know, in American history, there's kind of this longing for ruins. And the idea of kind of making ruins out of work that's still fairly contemporary is kind of interesting to me. Um, and, you know, there is a freedom of, of creating the work myself because then I can take ownership of it and then I can do whatever I want with it. And so there is a response to kind of the pristineness of how art is handled and how it's viewed and that type of thing too. One thing that was interesting in Japan is how they deal with history is, you know, we kind of cordon it off and like, you know, let, you know, make these these sort of tombs out of things where in Japan, you know, as a temple starts decaying, they hand down the tradition of how to construct the temple so they renew it every, I don't know how often, but their, con their history is like a living history that they're, they're these, the history is handed down through the craftspeople and they, the temple's always new, but yet it's like thousands and thousands of years old. And it, it's sort of like the cells regenerate in the body. And I thought that was so cool that their idea of history was circular, while ours was really linear, linear. So I'm sort of interested in that too. I have a question about the material you're using paper mache. Mm -hmm. have, uh, paper mache is not necessarily permanent that become an issue with you as far as working with galleries or selling more? Um, she was asking about the, the permanence of paper mache. Um, I I just use archival paper, paper and glue. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, archival paper can just be computer paper that doesn't have acid in it. Like my studio is right next to a staple, so I've like transitioned to going to staples at this point because I need so much paper. But um, if a collector is like nervous about archival materials, they'd probably stay away from me. Um, but then again, you know, a lot of drawings just on paper, so it's sort of it hasn't been. A, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I probably don't hear the other end of it. Who, how many people like walked away? But um, a lot. It hasn't been a big issue for me. It's sort of like the people that are okay with that. I was just curious. Yeah. I know sometimes galleries put pressure put pressure on you. You know, yeah. if that was an issue. And Not with my gallery. But Gilding Gray School is in Soho, and it's run by um, three very young people who are also artists. And they're, 
they just really liked my work and they sort of like, we never like, you know, that crazy cabin piece, somebody bought that and they were sort of like, yikes, like, yeah, <laughs> let's talk. And I'm just like, ah, I don't know, you know, so um, we kind of have been figuring things out as we went along. When you're working with the paper mache and you're making the pieces, like this piece on the wall, are they hard? Are you like yeah. drilling it and so it's an actual part of Yeah, yeah, they, they're, they're, the, the paper mache, and, uh, and a lot of times I'm, I started using plaster gauze too because it, you know, it's, and maybe putting paper mache over it or something, but it, it, giving it kind of more permanence. I mean, I wasn't trained in sculpture or paper mache, it's just like what I, I know how to make something kind of fast out of it, it works well, and I just haven't branched out considerably from it. I don't know, I hopefully will use other materials, but I think it might be more in terms of sending it out for casting after I make it or something, but, um, yeah, the pieces are quite hard, the ones that are three-dimensional. Well, the cabin looked at the also. Like yeah, the, just a corner of the cabin was three-dimensional. <coughs> it was sort of built up from the wall, but then it went flush to the wall. And what I was doing with some of the work is not gluing the layers of paper directly on the wall, but um, hanging fat white fabric stapled to the wall and then working on that. And, and then I could just remove it by pulling the staples out. So, but it looked, you know, it looked flushed to the wall. So yeah. um, that piece was dimensional and also flat too. In your decays or destroyed spaces, um, has anyone ever tried to like clean it up? Have you had to keep trash cans out of the room? Um, yeah, often I have. Often there's something that goes on with um, either me having at night to put a tape line and write like this is art, please don't throw it away. Like, if I want to leave like piles of debris on the floor, that has to be dictated to the right person because the cleaning people don't know what they're supposed to pick up. So yeah, there's always some weird note. Or um, At the Bronx Museum, like somebody, they were, I was like, just you know, leave the paper on the floor, like it's fine. And they're like, well, how, how often should we sweep around your piece? And like stuff like that where people are getting really specific and like there was like a hair that like fell out of someone's head and they're like, Do we, should we pick up that hair? And I'm like, well, you can pick up the hair. Like, and it, the Bronx Museum acquired a piece, um, which is what's in the show, and I have to talk to their conservation department about, I just want to put stuff on the floor, and they're like, well, we want to put stanchions around it. And I was like, I don't want stanchions, because you're just basically keying people. I just want it to be something they notice after, but you know, they're like, they're really worried people are going to steal this and I'm trying to stop the floor, which I, apparently no one has so far, but it's just kind of funny. Um, putting stuff on the floor like really freaks out museums. Um, and so they have like a security guard like, watching to see if someone steals the shredded paper on the floor. <laughs> I wanted to ask one more thing. Um, what, what was the, yeah, you've been doing this for a long time, but um, what was the initial thing, the very first thing when you saw that gave you a spark? make spaces like that or to make a, a tear on a wall? Um, I, don't, I don't know, it's kind of, you know, there's been an evolution. Before I went to grad school, I was sort of sewing um, fabric on the walls and peeling it off, so it almost looked like a skin like what Doho Sa does, but um, I'll say I was doing it first, but I was doing that. Um, but it's kind of looked like that. And so this idea of like being able to take these, um, skins of spaces and put them somewhere else in this layering of your life and all these spaces that you spend time in and kind of take away its memory. So I was sort of interested in that. And then um, I was using white fabrics, so they were kind of ghostly and I was, you know, interested in making these ghosts and I thought, well, why does it have, it doesn't have to like literally look like a ghost. So um, I went to painting and my undergrads in painting, so I was sort of went back to painting things to look like the spaces, but somehow keep them, you know, not having this huge physical, physicality to them. Um, but I wouldn't say there was like one thing that really sparked it necessarily. Have you yourself um, ever renovated houses? It no. Because it seems like you have like a, a, like a knowledge of just the whole process, mm -hmm. except it's in Except it's completely like absurd and non-functional. Yeah, I, I would love to do that, I think. Um, 
at the end of the day, like I'm so tired that it's like I can't, I couldn't take on that project, but um, it sort of looked like I'm renovating, but I'm like stapling cardboard to the wall or something. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that would be a really interesting process for me to do, and I would love to do it um, when, I, when I can sometime.